We have three topics for today. First is risk analysis, then is the communication plan, and we have acceptance criteria. And we're going to start with risk analysis. So basically, we're going to take a look at what is risk, um, and then how do you manage risk. So basically, risk doesn't really exist, right? It's not something that's tangible, that is somewhere. Risk is an idea. It is something that might or might not happen in the future. And because you think it might have a negative outcome, you'll call it a risk. So this means it's actually, it's hypothetical. It's socially constructed. It's something that's in the mind's eye for the group. Uh, sometimes you'll find that a group is scared of something. And because it's a danger that might happen and a programmer is really scared of it, everyone gets scared and it becomes this really big thing. But it really hasn't happened yet and you can basically manage it. So don't be afraid if these big dark clouds loom over your project. Don't just steer away in a different direction immediately. Um, so in this sense, by having this dark cloud or this risk that looms over your project, you might actually make decisions because you're scared of something and therefore it will actually happen or uh, it will create other risks. So you need to watch out with this and, and these management tools will help us to kind of objectify uh, risk. Now, basically depending on your strategy, you will kind of make a decision whether you will uh, address a risk or not. Um, so let's say you have a business risk, which is people quitting the game upon completion. Right? You might have a solution for that, which is create extra content, DLC packages. Um, this might have an extra risk, that your game is so addictive that people overspend or play it too much, which is a business risk of bad image. So just blindly going for a solution might actually work your hand into, uh, into it becoming another uh, risk. So the first step we need to do is identify risks. Um, so like I said, you need to watch out for confirmation bias. If you think something might happen, if you are afraid something might happen, you might see reasons everywhere around you that it is actually happening. This might not necessarily be the case. It's like if you buy a Volvo, you're going to see Volvos everywhere. Like that's confirmation bias. So um, it's about trying to see what's happening. The main takeaway from this first part is that these risks don't really exist. They are virtual, they're socially constructed, and it is our role to kind of objectivize these risks. We do this risk management in five phases. We identify risks, we give them a name, call out what they are, we describe them in detail, we attempt to quantify them in some way or form so that we can prioritize. We're going to have different response strategies, and then we might uh, need to control uh, the management of it and monitor it as time goes along. So this is uh, the five steps we'll be going through. So how do you identify a risk? Well, you basically just brainstorm with your team. It's what they call black hat thinking. You kind of use logic to determine what could go wrong. If you have a online component, there might be risks that you won't be able to use the online infrastructure that you think you will have. Or uh, if you are doing very complex new input systems, right? these are risks that might uh, happen in your project. So brainstorm with your team about things that might go wrong. Basically, you categorize these into clusters. So you kind of get categories of uh, risks, which could be technical, design, on people, resources, um, or it could also be more determined, uh, saying a category of progression design or a category of core mechanics. Um, it's important that you define these clusters afterwards. 
If you define the clusters first, you're going to be looking for answers in specific categories. But basically, you want to do the free brainstorm first and then cluster them into categories. Again, you can think in these, uh, these problems, this was also in one of the previous lectures, there are different kinds of problems, there are different kinds of risk. And um, you should take this into account while you uh, describe the risk. So this is kind of what this um, matrix stands for. You have known knowns, yes, but there are also uh, known unknowns. These are the things where you know that you don't know about them yet. The complex ones, unknown unknowns, this is, that's often the part where you really miss major things. So if you're doing the brainstorm, try to come up with what if scenarios. What if this system doesn't work? What if it works brilliantly and we might to want to add on it? Does that have an impact on other systems? Through some hypothetical reasoning uh, and brainstorming, you could actually catch some of these complex uh, problems and get them into the known sphere. Um, for simple risk, you basically list them all. If you have more complicated risk, you've got to seek information, right? First you describe a risk and then you're just going to seek some extra information about it. For complex uh, risk you can test and check. And for chaotic risks, if you have those, you're just going to assume the worst case scenario. That's often then a good starting spot. Now if you've identified what kind of risk it is, you describe it. And here's a template for how you can do those. It's important that you have the cause and the effect. This is just a template. You may use another one, but please do choose a template because then it becomes easier to compare the different risks. So for instance, setting the cause. Because of X, we'll have a problem of with Y resulting in some negative outcome. Um, in the template that I've uh, given you, or that you can find in the CMGT folder, this is the template that I'm using. So for instance, because of a lack of experience in the art department, there will be a problem with the creation of art assets resulting in delays of the integration of art. Right? This is kind of an objective format of describing a risk. Instead of art is lazy, art is incompetent, art is always late. Right? That doesn't work. This is a way of kind of trimming it down and making it um, concrete. Because of non-optimized code, problems with frame rate, resulting in frustrating latency. Right? This might be a uh, performance problem. Um, I was talking to someone about input lag. I don't remember who. Um, Oh, yeah, I do, Fabian. Right? We were talking about your game, and if you, if you would have input lag in your game, it would severely lead to bad game feel. So um, this might be a risk in your project, and through prototypes and research, you might need to see, can I overcome that? If you can't overcome it, what other solutions do you have to still make the game work with, with that input lag? Now, after you've described the risk, you want to give it some kind of of quantification so you can compare them with others. Um, so there are three parts to doing to quantifying a risk. One is the probability of it happening. Um, Godzilla might run over your studio. Might be a risk, right? But if you go into that atmosphere, uh, there might be a lot of risks that you're going to list out, which actually have such a low probability of ever happening that it's not really interesting to manage them. Um, but if you have critical bugs or uh, performance problems, for instance, well, if you find out that 8 out of 10 people have them, then that makes the priority higher. The second is severity. What would be the impact of the risk? Um, will it uh, delay the project? Will it have a big influence on people in your project? Is it something that happens in a part of the game? Is it one of the core systems that makes your game utterly unplayable? 
you could have several layers of severity, uh, which again are there to objectify these uh, risks. Often by itself, it's quite difficult to put a risk into a quantification of severity, but if you compare them to other risks, you can kind of say, well, it's, it's more severe than this one, right? So it's often through comparison, you can still put a, a label on it. Finally, there's proximity, which is when will it happen? Is it gonna happen next week or is it gonna happen next month? All else being equal, the project manager will focus on the one that is next week, at least if you think it's still salvageable. Now, if you put all these criteria together, you can kind of make a matrix of uh, probability and severity. You can kind of make a prioritization matrix. So this, for instance, uh, are the Ubisoft guidelines for, uh, for production. Uh, I'm not sure if they use this at every studio, but this is, uh, who was just here for Colleen? Colleen's lecture an hour ago. Um, this is what, uh, what she used when she was uh, still at uh, Ubisoft. At Vanguard Games, we didn't go in dips, this depth. We always had just three priorities. Um, but this is a way to basically measure them and go, hey guys, we have a code red drop your work because we need to address this now. Um, it's important that this is not only a manager's job, right? It's something you do with your entire team, finding, quantifying these. Um, you as a project manager or a producer won't have all the knowledge necessarily uh, to say how exactly how severe the bug is. Uh, so make sure that you get information from your team. Also, Adding risks to the risk management sheet or to the risk list, that's also not something that's solely there for the producer. I would tell my producer if I saw a risk arise and uh, she would then keep it in the list and make sure that it got monitored and things happened uh, to that risk. So it's something, it's a tool that all team members use, but that the project manager or the producer uh, manages. There are different types of responses. Can you name some? Shout some out. What could you do in terms of risk? Prevent it. Ignore it. Panic. Panic is always good. Run around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, acknowledge it and then do nothing. That's kind of the ignoring it. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. So in the example you're giving, um, you see it coming. Uh, you know its proximity on when it's gonna happen, you know you can't avoid it, so the probability of it happening is 100%, right? And then the question is, what do you do, right? How do you prepare for that event coming? I saw more hands going up, other responses? Yeah, work around, which could be a plan B uh, type of thing. Um, we had prevention, yes. We had ignoring slash acceptance. Workaround, contingency plan, yes. Okay, so then there's also reduction and transfer. Reduction would mean, well, we know it's coming. We know we can not prevent it, but at least we can limit the severity of it. So with prevention, you're gonna take away the possibility of it ever happening, right? So, cut the feature kill the project, right? If there is a risk of the project running late, if you kill the project, it won't run late. Uh, actually, this is a very common thing to have concept stages for projects, and if halfway into pre-production, management is not certain that they'll be able to sell the, the right amount, so they, just, they never go into production. They just kill it right then and there, which is basically um, preventing a lot of risks. Um, reduction would be 
buy other hardware before something goes wrong. Um, there's this term called functional redundancy. If you have someone in your team which is not fully assigned, then you have someone who's just able to, to run around and do things. If they, if they arise, right? If your team is fully booked for the full week, then anything that arises will cause a delay. But if you have this libero running around, being able to do things, that might actually uh, reduce a lot of the other risks that might come up. Um, if you have a risk of two people who are really unable to work together and who uh, create a bad vibe, maybe put them on different teams before it happens, right? This is uh, reducing the risk. Um, you could accept it, you kind of ignore it. Often if, it's, if the risk is bad enough, you don't totally ignore it. You just, every week you still take a look, you keep an eye on it, right? How much damage is it actually doing? But sometimes you can't prevent it, there's nothing you can do. Okay, you just go on. So often in terms of a producer, you need to inform your client, inform upper management, make sure you have some kind of monitor in place, um, put a bug as a low priority in the bug database so that it pops up a triage, but you don't really do anything about it. Conting contingency plan. Sometimes you, you set up uh, a backup plan. So. With GreetCorp, we had the problem of uh, opponent AI, which was a real big problem uh, to create a cool, fun, single-player game experience. And we had set out to do it through neural networking or neural AI. And for those of you who know what neural AI is, know how complex it is. Um, and we knew that there was a relatively high chance of it failing and never coming to the point where it was actually really fun and playable. So we just put another programmer on the alternate route, which was heuristics AI, rules of thumb AI. And um, we knew that one of both would throw away all their work. And we were investing in this for months. So we knew the costs, but we basically waged our bets to make sure that we went for both. Right? So that would be a contingency plan. Heuristics. Yeah. The problem with the neural AI was that it was becoming good, but every time we changed a single parameter, we needed to recreate all the data, and at some point it took around two weeks of total gameplay time on a couple of computers to, to teach itself the new rule set. So we were never able to uh, really bring that home. Um, the fifth is transferring the risk, right? Sometimes you can shift the responsibility to a third party. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, it, it costs money, right? But yeah, if, if you can incur the extra costs, so sometimes you can get an insurance, uh, insurance uh, on thing, or um, you can already recoup some publishing costs. Um, so for every risk, don't just blindly immediately say, well, we got to prevent this risk. We need to do everything we can to stop it from happening. That's not what risk management is about. It's about keeping an eye on it and then choosing the appropriate response. Um, you might actually find other responses, but they are often just variations of these types. But basically it's important that you're proactive about it. So in terms of ignoring the risk, I would call it accepting the risk and keeping a monitor on it. Then there's the step of control. So you need to control this process. And uh, basically, the main thing is you plan for a check phase, right? So for a risk, you're going to say this person at that moment is going to take a look again, whether the risk is still active, is it still valid, is the quantification still correct, should we keep heading the way we're heading, or should we change our response? Therefore, you also want to have some kind of closed status in your um, risk analysis tool, so that at some point the risk is over. Either you deem that it won't happen again, uh, or for some other reason it's not valid anymore. Also, 
it's important to monitor the progress to see whatever response you've chosen is it effective is it working um, so in essence uh, what we have with our project we would update our risk lists uh, to the client for every milestone that's the way we worked and that meant that every was around every month we would need to have an up-to-date documentation and the producer for themselves would kind of have a weekly update but it never really got out of the producers hands so that's how we worked with our risk database uh, and documentation now a little acronym that can help you oh, it's a, is the PDCA right you plan you do you check and you act um, so you plan for some kind of response you do that you check what happened and then based on that check you make some kind of action point which could be we don't need to do anything now our next check will be at that point any questions about risk analysis So I've given you uh, in the CMGT folder, you'll find a risk analysis template, which you can use uh, and alter if you want. Also, there, is a, uh, there are some tips on how can you lead a session where you find some people and actually brainstorm on what are my risks, because you don't do it alone as a producer. I think it would be beneficial for most of you to set up an initial risk list for your project right now, because one of the main risks that most of you are tackling right now is is my core gameplay fun does my input system work like those kinds of risks um, but at some point you're gonna say yeah I know the gameplay is not done it's just a prototype stage but I will go on because my next risk is will I be able to pull off this art style or uh, will I be able to create all the content that my uh, scope needs right so you get into pipeline risks and uh, other development risks so I think risk analysis is one where it's already interesting to, to make a setup right now. A large part of those risks will only be for production. So you won't be managing those closely now, but some of them will help you plan your own work for the coming weeks. What do you actually need to prototype and what are the questions to prototype? I see a lot of you in your straitjacket, you are doing prototyping, but the question of what actually does this prototype need to answer with some of you is quite weak and I think doing a risk analysis will help you create a better prototype question yep. other questions Yeah, so your question is how much detail do you need to show in what your response is? So I would, sh I would sh at least show the response category. Sometimes it will be evident what it is, how to prevent it, but I would kind of make a one or two sentence description of what actually are you going to do and when is the check, when it's going to be checked, whether, it, whether it's worked. So to me, a lot of that information was in, is in the check part of the template because there it states who will check it and when and it kind of says what should they check but this is something that you can do in multiple different ways you don't need to put a lot of information in there because that's not what the tool is for someone who is actually doing that task of preventing that risk he knows all the details about the task here we just care about what are our main risks and what are we doing for, uh, about those in the back No, all projects have risks. Um, sorry, I'm going to reiterate the question first. So who's the audience of this risk analysis? As you're basically asking, right? Is it the team or is it the client? Um, every project has risks. If you don't show the client that you understand what the risks are, then he's going to assume that it's all in the unknown, unknown parts, which can be really detrimental to your project. If you have a good grasp on what your risks are and how you're managing them, it actually shows more proactivity towards the client. Um, 
to me, this is mostly a tool that you use as a project manager or as a producer to assess what do we need to work on on this project. Often these kind of things are overhead costs. You need to do all kinds of things that have no direct relation to the quality of the end product. But it's trying to avoid something from happening and paying extra because you think that if you don't do it, that you'll have bigger costs later. Um, so in general, as for development, you, wanna, you don't want to do these too much. Because a lot of them are just, why, why not just build it right in one go? Right? Um, so to me, it's very much a project management tool. I do know that uh, I think all, probably all the contracts that I've worked on had risk analysis as part of the contract, where it was stated about who was doing the risk analysis and how often this was communicated, so that both publisher and developer had the same idea about what had priority and what, uh, what needs work. In terms of selling the, uh, the proposal, it might be that your risk analysis will show that to prevent these big risks, there's actually an extra budget post, there's extra money you're gonna ask for this project next to just the normal development cost because you're gonna say, well, I need to do this to prevent these risks or circumvent them or have contingency plans. And that's why I'm extra billing you extra. Last question? Cool. Then we go to part two. If this, yes, it does. Dude, come here. No, it's the other way. There you go. Which is communication plan. So, um, yes, some of you have been using the communication plan uh, learning objective for internal communication. Uh, I saw this especially last block where people are going, well, we communicate with our team through Slack and we have this Trello board for these and we have these daily stand-ups and that's like an internal communication plan, uh, which is fine to do. Um, what I'm talking about now is specifically an external communication plan. Often, again, this is part of the project proposal it sometimes becomes part as an appendix of the contract and it states who's going to communicate with whom, who's taking initiative, so that later when shit hits the fan, you actually have something to fall back on. So first I'm going to talk a bit about different levels of communication and then we'll go in depth into uh, what the communication plan is and how you can set it up. Communication is a big part of, of management. Of, uh, in project management, it's, it's, a, it's really one of the core things we do, is make sure that everyone has the same understanding of what needs to be done when, and then make sure that that gets done. So actually taking a moment to think this through and come up with a proper plan uh, is actually really worth your while, especially on larger projects. Uh, any group beyond 15 people will not be able to communicate without any structure. Within 15 people, you might be able to pull it off if people know how to find each other uh, properly, says social design theory. Anyway, um, the RACI, 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 RACI matrix. This might help you in, in understanding the different parties involved and what different levels of communication are. Right? We have people who are uh, responsible. Th those are the people actually doing the work. Right? So that would be the developer or an artist or a freelance, uh, freelancer working for you. But you also have people who are accountable and this might not be the exact same person. These are the people on being accountable that something gets done, for instance. You have people who need to be consulted. People whose opinions on the outcome really matter. And there are people who are just standing by the sideline, but they need to be informed on a periodical basis. Right? Upper management, a CIO or a CFO. Those are the people who don't really care about everything, all the details, but they need to have a periodic report on, on what's happening. So for instance, let's take the functional design of feature X. Right? It's the game designer who creates the functional design. 
together with a techie and an artist, they, you set up a AFD. But it might be the lead designer who actually signs off on it and validates that it's correct and complete. Right? If later something goes wrong, we don't go to the game designer to tell him off, but we go to the lead designer because it was his job to make sure that it was done properly. In this case, the customer needs to be talked to because we need to understand what his needs and wishes are, which are actually the basis of the functional design and the concept design before it. Um, and the project manager just needs to be uh, needs to track uh, progress on on this feature. Has the is the functional design done? Is the first implementation done? Is the feature bug free? Right. So this is how for any specific topic you could kind of draw out um, what the role of different people are. Now there will be many different audiences, right? So you have the internal, which is the team, including you. Um, there's customers, and then there's this term called stakeholders. Uh, don't uh, confuse stakeholders and stockholders. Stockholders are people who have stock in a business, um, aandelen in Dutch. They have bought their own, they own part of the company. Stakeholders have some interest in some project. So they're vastly different terms. Often stockholders may be stakeholders. Let's start with uh, you and your team. So obviously, these are the people who actually deliver things in the project. Right? So you need to talk to them on a day-to-day -day basis as a manager. Uh, this is the internal communication part that I was talking about earlier. Generally, communication can be top-down and bottom-up. Ideally, you'll, you'll have a conversation which has both. But if you think about customers, already in your projects, you can see that there are different categories of customers. On the one hand, you have your client, right, which could be Danny for the in-flight. So that's the tourism department of NHTV. But then that could also be KLM as a client. But actually, there's also this end consumer, right, the, the people going on the flight actually playing the game. So you have different categories of, of clients. And now the question is, is Panasonic in here? Is Panasonic part of the clients or not? So you can kind of group different categories in the client uh, part. Often it has these two layers. You have the person paying you, publisher or someone else who commissions the project. And then there's some end consumer and the people who are actually paying. If you look more into free-to-play games, you get another uh, client in there because the players are not actually paying, but who are paying? Well, maybe through incentivized ads. It might be that some other company uses this for advertisements. So they are, in the end, kind of a client as they pay for advertisement through your game. So then you might have other levels of uh, other categories of uh, clients or consumers. Um, then there are stakeholders, and this is like the broad catch-all term. I think in the terms of the in-flight entertainment uh, pitch that Panasonic would be a stakeholder. They want to have good content on their technology, but they're not directly paying for it. They're not directly playing your games. But if their consoles or in-flight consoles have the best content, then, well, other uh, flight agencies will want to have their technology as well. So, in a broad sense, stakeholders are all the people who are impacted by the project, either in a positive or a negative sense. Um, so, this could be you need to manage expectations of people who are around the project, or it could be that you um, need to identify supporters who are out there, people who feel for the same cause as you have. So in terms of if you're doing a health, uh, the game for health, uh, there might be parties out there who are very interested, who have the same goal as you have in terms of eating healthy or uh, getting better sleep or working with, uh, with your depression. And those people are out there, they don't, they're not a client role, but they do have stake in, in uh, that you results that your project will have um, are positive. 
this kind of shows them all in one image, right? So the end consumers are the people using that road. Now the new road is being built by this project team. There are stakeholders all around, which could be the people in the city who need to uh, travel up and down to the city every day, or it could be the people who are living right next to, beside the road um, uh, who have a lot of noise uh, overlast. Oh, sorry, blackout. Um, and then there's also the client, right, which is the state who actually commissions this road uh, being built. And this client might actually have different levels with province, municipality, state. So think about your project and all the different layers um, of people that you need to communicate with. It's up to you to adapt to all these different groups and communicate effectively, effectively uh, with them. You'll find that at some point the audiences will overlap. Um, there's always this question to how far do you need to break it down into subgroups. That's a design decision which is up to you. Uh, generally if there's too much overlap, whatever that means exactly, but if there's too much overlap you probably take them as one, uh, as one group. Um, I always like to think about it in practical terms in the end. Are you approaching them as one group, dear consumer, or are you going to be uh, talking to them into uh, as if they were separate groups and specialized groups? Then it makes sense to cut them up as well. Now, as for the actual plan, the actual tool, there are four basic things that the communication plan has. It's the objective, it's the target, the message, and the action, which is basically the why, what, why, who, what, and how. Uh, so let's go over those. All oh, right, terms, yes. Um, as with any plan, it's important to make these efficient and effective. Do you guys know the difference between efficient and effective? He did the course before you, and he still remembers, which is two years ago. So that's good. Colleen did a good job back then. Yes. Effectivity means doing the right thing, choosing the right response that has the maximum output. Efficient means doing this in a way that is actually cost efficient or resource efficient. It's very much about how you do it. Right? So the objective, the why, is very much uh, about making sure that you choose an effective uh, um, thing to communicate, that you're doing it in an effective way. and the who, what, and how are very much about making sure that you're doing it in an um, efficient manner that doesn't cost too much overhead uh, for the output it generates. So basically, for the objective, you'll write down what's the goal that you have in mind. Why, what are you communicating and what things do you need to communicate? So, for instance, uh, change management is an important one. It might happen throughout your project that you will want to make changes to your concept design because you find out things, things pop up, you know this will happen. So at that point, how will you communicate with your client about this change? So the objective here is how do we prepare uh, an important change to the concept? It's actually often in real life the target, the people who are being communicated with, they don't know the exact objective that the person starting the communication has. So just a little side point. But if you know what your goal is, you're going to ask yourself, so who should I target this at? Um, so this is why it comes in handy to have different levels of the audience so that you have identified who you will be in contact with. Now for the targets in your communication plan, you want to be really specific. Like if you say to the client, well, who's the client? Does the client have an account manager or not? If there's a stakeholder committee, are you gonna just communicate with the info at, at their thing or have you gotten a name and a telephone number of someone who works there? Um, 
if you're talking about communicating with end consumers, it's often a question, can you create some kind of ambassadors? Can you create some people who have a, let's say, high standing within the player community? Uh, so through your forums, you will get some kind of veteran status. These people can often help in creating communication. So if you want to create a communication to your players, are you going to do it directly to all of them? Or are you going to give information to a limited set of people who then dissipate this information further on? All these questions are answered in, uh, in the target column of your communication plan. Then there's the question, what exactly are you going to communicate? So this is basically the, the exact sentence, right? Can you, can you set down what the message is in, in one sentence? Basically saying, we have changed the progression design and we want to have your approval, right? That could be the, the message for the preparation of a change or the project is on the right track. The actual communication, the email itself will probably have a li little bit more text than this, but this is like the general message that you want to get across. Finally, we have the how. How will you communicate this? Is this through Slack? Is this through an email? Is this through a wiki? How does this work? Through what medium are you going to reach your target? So um, you might say, well, anytime if we're going to have a big conceptual change to our project, we're going to first set up a call. And after that, we will actually set up a meeting. Because big design changes that have a big impact on the contract will always be done face to face. right? These kind of things go into the communication plan so that everyone knows when the project gets signed what we're up against. So this would be an example. The objective is we want to get client input and consent on a uh, conceptual change. So the target here is the client, which might be the account manager. The message is development has led to new insight. We have a proposal for a change. And now these are the steps, the four different actions that we'll take to change it. Right? If you put this in a contract, everyone knows that no big changes can just be made. There's always these steps, and the client needs to give a go or no go within three days, right? because you can't get stuck in development. So there's these kind of really quantifiable, practical things you can put into the communication plan to make it clear for everyone. Is this example clear to everyone? Because this kind of culminates the entire lecture, actually. Right. Um, yeah, so the exact strategies of how will we handle the exact decision um, is probably too much detail to exactly go into everything. So as far as the communication plan is concerned, you want to answer these questions of, of why, who, uh, what, and how. Um, you could in the how include some points in that, but it, it will easily turn into real pages of information. So I would kind of steer away from that. Um, the main reason, again, why we do this is to make sure that when we sign the contract, this ends up as some kind of appendix so that every, both parties know what their role of the bargain is if these kind of things happen. If you don't write it up beforehand, it's just all ad hoc. And I've seen some really strange things happen um, where someone needs to make a decision at some point and it's not always the best decision for project. So, in terms of the, uh, the project work that we expect from you guys is you will give a proposal which kind of may lead into a, uh, into a contract. So think about the different moments that you will want to communicate with the client throughout development and make sure those get noted down in a plan. I think I have that here as well. Yeah, um, again, the part about identifying your targets is a bit of, let's say, diligent, right? It's not very often very creative. It's just doing your uh, groundwork and checking really who should we target. The message itself, and especially how we're going to convey messages, sometimes you can have a lot of uh, creativity in there, especially if you're communicating with uh, end consumers. 
uh, it's more marketing and there can be some really creative ways there. Um, yeah, so these are some things that you might uh, put in your communication plan, how you can handle big design changes, how will you handle milestone acceptance, how will you handle periodical development updates, but it's also up to you to think a bit what your project needs and what are the things you should have in your communication plan. Yeah, quickly going on for the last one. Where am I? There I am. Which is acceptance criteria. Um, acceptance criteria is the tool you use to be objective about the end quality. If the project's over, and the client comes to you and says, well, the game is broken. It doesn't work. You need to fix it. And you're going to go like, yeah, but that's going to cost me 10K, 20K. Are you going to have to pay that money? Or is the client going to have to pay that money? Once that happens, you're too late in discussing it. It's going to be power negotiations. If you do it up front, you can have a clear, relatively clear plan about how you will work with these kinds of situations. Before we get to the acceptance plan as a, as a project management tool, I first want to say something about monitoring. So monitoring is something that a manager does, right? It's, it's something that you, you monitor how things are going. It's like a regular surveillance, uh, keeping something on a systematic review. Um, basically, at any point, your boss might come to you and say, well, what's the status of the project? And you should be able to say, well, and then you give them some numbers. You're able to give them, we're on track, we're not on track, we're almost on track. That's what monitoring is. In a project, you generally monitor stuff like the project constraints, right? How are we doing for time? How are we doing in terms of cost and budget? How are we doing in terms of scope? But this is a bit impractical to just measure by itself. So how would that work? Well, you could say, well, for content, which is mostly on the scope and the quality of the, of the content, we can, we can measure by, by terms of acceptance criteria. Progress towards the end of development will be in terms of time and cost, and that will be in terms of schedules and velocities. Are we reaching, are we hitting our barn down charts? Are we hitting our sprints, right? This is the kind of things you can monitor as a manager to see whether you're uh, progressing nicely. In terms of business value, you can see, well, what, what's our return on investment? What, what is our pro, uh, profit and loss statement like? Basically, this is very much about what are the key performance indicators of the project and is the project actually creating the value that we wanted to create? We'll talk about key performance indicators and monetization next week, about how you can monitor those. For now, I basically want to talk about the acceptance criteria. But this diagram shows you that basically these acceptance criteria are very much about the scope and quality of the content that you're creating. They're not so much about, is it delivered on time, right? That's, you check that somewhere else. So as a manager, you should always be able to give an instant picture of where the project stands. Instant would generally mean the boss would kind of give you an hour, right? We have a meeting, I've got a, the boss has got a meeting with someone in an hour and they need a report. And you have half an hour or an hour to put all the data together and to give him his report on whether you're on track or not. And again, it's important to, um, to plan these processes early on. Now, how does this uh, acceptance criteria work? Well, the game needs to be reliable. The game needs to be triple A, right? Or even worse, the game needs to be fun. If the game's not fun, then the project didn't succeed, right? And then the client's gonna say, well, go back and, and redo it because I, I ordered a fun game. 
these are the quality expectations and this is an awesome little graph that takes me three minutes to explain and I don't have it so check it out later but basically it's about all the different things that can and will go wrong in your communication basically we want to convert these client uh, clients expectations into acceptance criteria if you're gonna build a box with a hole then the ideas of what that thing is might vary wildly between what you and what the publisher or client think so the general tip and you you've heard about smart right in the self-reflection classes anyone able to call them out SMIRT specific measurable attainable no relevant realistic yeah and time almost sounds like a mantra <laughs> it's really scary uh, yeah so if you're gonna say well the game needs to be reliable well you could say well we're gonna have less than 1% server downtime right I just tried to log into Clash Royale and they said they have server maintenance I'm like what the games that's not right it feels bad as a player um, you need to set up development systems to make sure that if a server goes down that another one picks it up and that the loads get balanced and those kind of things right um, we all know how bad Call of Duty or Street Fighter uh, have been at doing their online multiplayer right it's the server downtime is is really bad but you can make this very quantified if you're gonna have something that trains people as a tool then you could say well it requires less than an hour of training to get to get working with it right so that might be it's still kind of vague but it's at least more qual uh, quantitative than just easy to use well don't say that the game will be fun in the end but you might say that 70 percent of all the players who are doing playtests have shown high levels of engagement right then the question is how do you define that high level of engagement but these are things that uh, we'll talk to you about about playtesting as well but you can really quantify these um, amount of smiles yeah the amount of smiles per, smiles per minute <laughs> smiles per second uh, the amount of yeah moments the amount of frowns right in, in proper usability uh, testing we had it with uh, EA they sent us back like a booklet of playtesting results and it was amazing the detail they had gotten from all their players in terms of uh, checking their respiration and checking their um, their uh, sweatiness in their hand palms and they had uh, eye recognition where they were looking and they had so much data about our game which helped us improve it so much in that end stretch so the quantification and, and doing usability testing especially in the world of, of webland of um, the internet has come quite a far way quite a long way so there's stuff there we can borrow and use I've got two minutes so I'm gonna rush through the end basically you want to think about these two things what are my quality criteria right what platforms does it need to run on what are the resolutions that will be supported these are the kind of things you will make explicit in your proposal but also about the quality method how will the, this project's quality be checked are you doing that are you hiring a QA firm to do it for you does the client have a role in this yes or not and this fun how are you gonna measure how are you gonna quantify that so in terms of quality method think about who will be doing this QA and what's an acceptable level of quality and if you went to the QA uh, lecture last block, otherwise you'll be able to find it in a CMGT folder in production. But there's a QA process, right? Your proposal should have a little idea about how QA is gonna work for this project. If not only to show the client that you understand what it, what it is and what the client's role is here. In terms of your project plan, don't do the acceptance criteria for each milestone for other projects you might do this but for now that's going to be too much detail do it for the end project deliverables right, right. So, so think, think about, about 
We do, we do a proposal, proposal where we're creating this game, and at the end product of the game, whether it's your beta launch, or your soft launch, or whatever you have as your final milestone in your high-level plan, set the acceptance criteria for those. Make sure they're smart acceptance criteria, and show what you are responsible for. And then it shouldn't just say, we build a chair. But it should quite clearly describe what kind of chair what's its purpose is, is and whether you need to check, check does it sit nicely or is it nice on the eye, eye or need it here. Any, Any questions? questions? Cool. cool, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much and see you guys later. later.